काय दगडपल्ले सर स्टार्टिंग मध्ये यु विल इंट्रोड्यूस ना द सेमिनार अँड देन आय विल इंट्रोड्यूस डॉक्टर दिवाटिया यूट्यूब पण चालू झालंय युट्यूब करू शकता हॅलो शीतल मॅडम अगं मी ट्रेनिंग ला आहे ना इतकं गडबड झाली आहे हॅलो 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 अगं एक्झरसाइज मध्ये माझं स्पाईन हे झालं तरी बसून बसून करते कशी तरी बाकी कसं सुरू आहे बाकी मजेत जोरात जोरात लाईफ लावा बाहेरचा आवाज तुम्ही करून बसा लाईफ लावा बाहेरचा आणि आवाज तुम्ही करून हॅलो डॉक्टर सुजाता मॅडम हॅलो गुड इव्हनिंग सर मॅडम तुम्हाला मी को होस्ट केलंय तुम्ही पार्टिसिपंट ऍड करू शकता मीटिंग मध्ये अच्छा ओके येस येस सर गुड इव्हनिंग सुजाता मॅडम गुड इव्हनिंग गुड इव्हनिंग सर सव्वीस तारखेच्या ड्रेस मध्ये दिसत आहे गुड इव्हनिंग मॅम गुड इव्हनिंग हाय मॅम हाव आर यू ऑल फाईन जी सी मेंबरचा ड्रेस कोड आहे 
हेलो करना मैडम गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग हाउ आर यू मैम डूइंग वेल ओके वेटिंग फॉर टुमारोज वेबिनार वी आर हैविंग टुमारो वेबिनार विद डीएम डायबिटीज एनेसेटिस परस्पेक्टिव विल बी वी हैव ऑलरेडी सेंड अ लिंक टू आवर प्रेसिडेंट ग्रुप ओके जॉइनिंग लिंक आल्सो टुमारो बेस्ट वेशेस मैम या 7:15 ऑनवर्ड्स यस I'll join. We don't have time earlier, so I'll be waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How how did the New Year start? <laughs> With a big bang. Big bang. Okay. <laughs> We had a reunion of fifty uh, fifty years golden reunion of of our batch. Excellent. MBBS batch. Yeah. Nineteen seventy four. Seventy four. Yeah. So, right. That was a great event this year <laughs> for me. Uh, I think almost twenty-four people have joined. They are the time is six thirty, I suppose. Yeah. Good evening, Balaji sir. Oh, good evening. Good evening, sir. What is good evening. Hello, good, good evening, evening sir. Oh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, yes. good evening Balaji sir. Good evening. Oh, good evening, madam. गुड इवनिंग दिवाती हां गुड इवनिंग सर दिवाती इज ऑन जॉइन कर लेने तो सर हां या इज जॉइन ओके गुड इवनिंग दिवाती सर Sir, need need to unmute him, sir. Yeah. Okay, sir. Unmute you, sir. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Sorry. Good evening, good sir. Evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, good evening. Good evening, sir. Hello. Good evening, Shikal. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, Jiji, sir. Good evening. Or are you just see whether the screen sharing is working? Ah, uh, yeah. Someone left to. Not able to see your screen. You want someone? Someone left to make me the host. Ah, uh, Ganesh. Ganesh. Yeah. Sir, Anna, host for our place. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. We are able to see. You are able to see the screen. Yes, yes, yes. Recent advances in IBM management. Yes. Yes. Screen. Yes. Yes. We are able to hear you. We are able to see your screen. Okay. I'll stop sharing one second. Okay. No. Ganesh, Doctor Sujit Khadi sir, na pun host karon ta. Okay sir. Sir na pun screen share kare jine ta. Rajesh sir, apne kare PPT ahe na dancha flash kare la introduction. Rajesh sir, thank you. Oh. Ganesh. <laughs>
Sir, you want to start at 6.30 or we'll wait for five minutes? We'll wait. Okay. You wait at least for two, three minutes and then we'll start. Okay. Good evening, Jiggy, sir. Yeah, hi, good evening, Manish. Good evening, madam. Dr. Balaji, good evening. Dr. Rajesh, uh, good evening. Good evening. Parana, good evening. Good evening, Manisha, madam. Silpa, madam, good evening. Vatkar, madam, good evening. Hello, madam. Hello, madam. <laughs> Hello, Sheetal. <laughs> Hello, madam. Everyone, please join for tomorrow's webinar at 7.15 onwards. Diabetes, under diabetes by SAPC, Society of Anesthesia and Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm admitting everyone who was. Uh, meantime, shall we uh, discuss again the, uh, the upcoming events in these two to three months, sir? Balaji, sir, any upcoming events in Anasya? Oh. Like, uh, yes, madam. Yeah. Meantime, until the people join, I think uh, yes. your Anasya conference. Okay, critical care. Yes. Then Karada Anasya conference is there, in Nagpur. Okay. Can you just name the dates, sir, so that people will know? 9, 10th and 11. February. Yeah. 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 So there's a lot of people. Someone has got two, has got two devices. Yes. Madam Nuro Anastasia conference is there in Pune. FNAC conference. FMC, I am one of the executive members. Yes, yes. 18th, 18th, 18th February. 18th, 17th, 18th February. 18th February, yeah. That's our day, FMC. Hmm. Yes, yes. So it's 6.34 now. So. Yes, we can start. Hmm?
good evening all and i welcome you all uh, on the behalf of sans on the first sans webinar in our tenure that is 23 to 25 i welcome dr jigi sudhivati sir our beloved president of iso nation i welcome dr monisha katukar ma'am national dc dr pankaj gupta sir Dr. Cham Sir, Dr. Hitendra Basan Sir, I welcome Dr. Balaji Asegaukar, our President Sams, Dr. Anita Nithe Madam, President Elik Sams, Dr. Avinash Posle Sir, Vice President, Dr. Vikas Karne, our Treasurer, and Parnath Sir Ma'am, Sams News Editor. I welcome all the ISA members, all President and Secretaries, and the GC from the City Branches. we are starting webinar series on behalf of sans with basic theme about recent advances in anesthesia to start with we will we'll have a webinar on recent advances on airway management by our beloved national president dr jigesh divatia sir and recent drug that is sugamadex by dr sujit khare sir I would like to request Dr. Balaji, our president, to brief on this webinar series and give idea behind this webinar and the contents of the webinar. Good evening to all of you, uh, respected Devatia Sir, Manisha Madam, all office bearers of SAMS, and my dear friends. Uh, we thought uh, we will do something different as far as nowadays. Lot many activities are going on. throughout uh, the state of maharashtra so we thought why not to this year dedicate this year for recent advances in various field in this regard i called dr divatia sir and he readily accept our invitation and so we are really fortunate that our uh, start of this series is with our uh, national president and who, one of the best academician of india dr uh, divatia sir agreed to talk on this topic every month we will try one or the other field of anesthesia and what the recent things are going on and i think uh, we all will be greatly benefited with this activity i request all gcs president secretaries to please percolate this activity uh, to at your level so that maximum people will get the benefit i wish best luck for this activity and thank you very much for joining this activity start with the lecture of dr jigesh divatia sir i would like to request dr parna thakkar ma'am to introduce divatia sir good evening all good evening all now i invite our beloved isa national president dr jigesh divatia sir to give a talk on recent advances in the airway management Sir is a professor and head of the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care and Pain Management at Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. He is the past president of Society of Onco Anesthesia and Perioperative Care and past president of ISCCM. He is the editor in chief of the journal Airway and the past editor in chief of Indian Journal of Anesthesia. He has over one ninety nine publications in national and international journals. Sir is an excellent teacher, guide, and a role model to many of us, including me. Over to you, Devatia sir. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Balaji, State SAMS President, Dr. Rajesh, Secretary of SAMS, my GC members, and GC members from SAMS. so thank you very much for having me here and uh, congratulations on starting this uh, activity on recent advances in an anesthesia uh, it's always a good idea to be in touch with recent advances very often we feel that some of the recent advances are we cannot use in our practice we cannot uh, it's too expensive it's too far fetched it's too this thing but uh, you know it's never bad to have knowledge and uh, nowadays uh, 
things become available and uh, much faster and much better, we can innovate and we can do some jugad and replicate some of those uh, things that are there. But I think at the end of the day, the it's the idea that counts. It's that, that if we can get the new ideas that are uh, going on across the world, I think that will make a big difference to how we eventually practice practice for the benefit of our patients and all, and also for ourselves. So <clears throat> I will be Hello. We lost, uh, I think, sir's voice. Yes. I think the connection is not from side, most probably. At least in my opinion, in the last. Hello, sir. We are unable to hear you intermittently. I think sir is not there now. He got disconnected. Yes, madam. Network problem. Yes. Call. yes, I'll call him. Hello. Yeah. Now I'm back on, I think. So yes. in, we have lost your voice. Yeah, yeah, he's back now. You can restart, I think. He's, I just called him. He said, I'm back. Oh, you can't hear me still? Yeah, now we can hear you, sir. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So, okay. So, nothing. So, when I was a PG at the beginning of my career, you know, so we all used to intubate. And at that time, that's all we had. We had the you have pentone, you gave sucks, you gave IPPV and you try to put in the tube. If you're not able to put in the tube, then you know you're in a bit of trouble because then all you could do is call someone else or you know put in an oral or nasal airway if you're having difficulty in ventilation. And if you still had a problem, you know, you just keep trying maybe some more anesthetists, some more attempts. At the most, you had to still it. You try some uh, nasal uh, tube, maybe you'd get a long blade. Uh, Bullard blade and McCoy and all, at least we didn't have where I was working. And if everything else failed, then you just shout out to the surgeon and say, do a tracheostomy. And and at the end of the day, what we were doing is basically we would pray that, uh, you know, things would go on well. Okay. So this is what was the concept of the difficult airway. So, you know, we gave a pre-oxygenation, we induced, we gave a relaxant. And I think that is always the crux of the problem. We produce apnea. And while the patient is apneic, we do mask ventilation, did laryngoscopy and we intubated. And usually these things work, you know, you usually get the tube in, so you, or almost always you'd be able to do face mask ventilation. But the occasional patient where you are not able to get the tube in, you're not able to do face mask ventilation, then you would be in deep, deep trouble. And that is what we defined as a difficult airway, where you had a technical problem in doing any of these things during the apneic period. And of course, if you were not able to do it for a long time, then the patient would suffer hypoxic brain damage and probably die. Right? Uh, however, we've come a long way since then. And now we've got so many devices, we've got so much technology, we've got so many techniques which have helped us overcome many of these difficulties. Right? Almost uh, the amount of difficulty we have is much reduced now with all the modern gadgets and tools that we have. And we are really fortunate to be living in an era there's so much technology is available and it's available at all levels of price, right? You can get uh, things very quite cheap and of course, there's a thing which are cost uh, very a lot, but you can get and most of the things are available for us to use. And we are really fortunate that we are practicing in this era today as compared to what was happening, say, 30 years ago. So, <clears throat> and if you ask me the one thing that has really changed how airway management has happened has been the introduction of a laryngeal mask. And although it he, Dr. Archie Brain introduced it or invented it in 1981, it was almost over 10 years before it became 
commercially available and was easily uh, available and widely used. And this was that, so this was a laryngeal mask, which we all sort of know. And, you know, it was very unique because till then, either you had a face mask or you had an endotracheal tube. And this was some something in between. So the tip of the mask fitted somewhere into, in, into the upper end of the esophagus. And this cuff sort of folded around and enclosed the, <coughs> the laryngopharynx. And you could sort of mask ventilate. Uh, you could ventilate by this. So your hands were free. You had a face mask. It was not as stimulating as the endotracheal tube. You did not need a lot of expertise to put it. It was very rapid to insert and a very high success rate. And if your ventilation was difficult, you know, you could get ventilation going very easily. And sometimes, you know, if you were just not able to intubate the patient, your ventilation was also very, becoming difficult. It was a fantastic rescue device. And in fact, a lot of the, uh, the publicity or, or a lot of uh, excitement because the incidence of failed intubation and failed ventilation actually came down dramatically once you used to start putting this, this mask in. You could put a tube through it, but that success rate was variable. And of course, you could also give anesthesia through it. And very soon, uh, especially in the UK, people were doing simple cases only on a laryngeal mask and they were not using face mask and they were not intubating. And many of these were being done on face mask. There were, of course, there were problems because it was not a gas tight seal. There was no cuff in the trachea. You could get aspiration and uh, aspirated material, you know, because a cuff enclosed the entire sort of uh, pharynx, uh, laryngopharynx from outside, the material that came up through the esophagus could actually go down in the trachea. So that was a problem because in up to 10% of cases, the esophagus in opening could be included in the cuff, you know, so it would not be a perfect placement. Very importantly, you, it was mainly used initially for spontaneous ventilation simply because if you gave positive ventilation, pressure ventilation, there would be a leak. The cuff was not good enough that it uh, to uh, allow a, a reasonable uh, uh, positive pressure to be delivered. And if you gave pressure more than 15 or 20 centimeters of water, you'd start getting a leak around the cuff and then hypoventilation would occur. Uh, and of course, you know, all those sort of things in incorrect position, folding of the tube. You could not put more than a six millimeter tube through the uh, tube of the laryngeal mask. And also very importantly, it, the reliability was not very reliable quantity. The success rate was varied between 30% and 90%. So, you know, you could not swear and say that I'll blindly put the tube in and it will go into the trachea. That was not very easy. So the laryngeal mask was a fantastic breakthrough. You know, it completely changed the way we started looking at airway. Endotracheal intubation did not become the prerequisite. Face mask ventilation, you know, became so much easier. But there were these problems of not, not having a gas tight uh, seal, risk of aspiration, and not being able to give positive pressure ventilation beyond 15, 20 centimeters of water. Okay, which basically meant if you had a patient with bad lungs, patient with asthma, bronchospasm, a fat obese patient who required higher pressures, you would not be able to use the that laryngeal mask effectively. And this was sort of overcome by the what we now call as a second generation of laryngeal masks. Okay? And these masks, the second generation masks, were specifically designed for use with positive pressure with or without muscle relaxants and higher airway pressures. In other words, you, the patients were able, you would get a better seal with that cuff and you would not get uh, a leak if, even if the pressure went up to say 25 or 30 centimeters, or 25, 20, 25, 30 centimeters of water. So you could actually do a lot of positive ventilation in a large number of these patients okay so this these have sort of become the norm now and why were they much better masks and the design was such that not only did they allow a higher pressure to be delivered they sort of separated the uh, tubes going to the alimentary tract which is the stomach and the tube going to the towards the laryngeal opening so one cuff sealed the laryngeal opening and the rear cuff which went towards the in the pharynx towards the alimentary tract that sort of sealed increased the seal and there were two tubes, one which led to the alimentary tract, to the esophagus, and one in through which went a respiratory tract through which you gave ventilation or you connected your anesthesia circuit. So the improved laryngeal seal allowed higher pressures. The drain tube, which was the esophageal tube, allowed blind insertion of a gastric tube, so you could even drain off the stomach. And, you know, so these things allow, give you a little more confidence in giving positive pressure ventilation and in hopefully reducing the potential for risk of aspiration. So these were... A considerable advance 
in these sort of things. And once you got these masks in, then there were all sorts of uh, variations uh, and different types of uh, second generation supraortic devices. So what I showed you earlier was the ProSeal, which is a reusable mask. And then you got a disposable one called the Supreme. Okay. Then you got a uh, eye gel, which don't have an inflatable cuff, but which are a sort of polymer, which expanded to seal the larynx because of body temperature. You had the Ambu R again. You got an even better mask now called the Protector, LMA Protector, which uh, allows actually more reliable blind uh, insertion, uh, endotracheal tube insertion. And the way it is designed, you know, the if there is fluid coming out from the esophagus so the gastric contents are coming out they sort of drain away from the larynx so this seems to be much better and you have some uh, devices like the LMA gastro which allow you to do a, a gastroscopy and put an endoscope through the it's a the a gastric uh, tube okay so the, all these are improvements in the design of the mask which again make hopefully will make, okay, they've not been extensively tested and, you know, because you need large numbers of patients to do this, to be confident. But from whatever experience we have, it appears that the risk of aspiration is not high and certainly a positive pressure ventilation can easily be given. A newer type of mask called a Basca mask, and some people call it a third generation uh, supraglottic airway device. You know, is uh, it's got a unique design. It's got this cuff, right, which is a membranous cuff. And every time you give positive pressure, that seal around the larynx increases. So in other words, you can get an even better seal than what the second generation uh, devices give. And you can give even more positive, higher positive pressure, uh, ventilation at higher positive pressures. And you can give even, it has an even lower uh, risk of gastric insufflation, uh, so of gastric aspiration. So this is again, uh, yet another advance. So these supercortic airway devices, have made life really simple because you don't need the kind of expertise that you need to do with the uh, tracheal intubation. Okay. And you don't, it doesn't stimulate the reflexes as much because they stay above the trachea, whereas the endotracheal tube is in the trachea and actually the, the sympathetic and other reflexes that you get by a tube in the trachea are much, much more than what you get with the tube, which is about in the pharynx. Okay. So once you had these sort of laryngeal masks and once you had these second and third generation devices and people were using them more and more and they got more and more confident and competent in the use of these masks, what were previously considered contraindications, you know, conditions where you would have a high airway pressure like obesity, like uh, laparoscopic surgery, uh, a low chest wall compliance with the risk and all these potential problems of risk of aspiration, risk of displacement are all there. With time, people have started using these uh, supraortic airway devices, even in these sort of conditions. Now, I am not advocating that you must use or you should use them in these conditions. All, all I'm saying is because these airways have a better design nowadays, people have become more bold and more confident. Uh, I'm not making a comment and please don't quote me and saying that I have said that you can use the laryngeal mask. I don't use any of these conditions. Okay, I don't use a supraortic airway device for any of these conditions, but I know there are a lot of people who do. Uh, and hopefully, you know, because of the, uh, these designs, hopefully their the patients are going to remain safe. Okay, Including patients undergoing cesarean section, which uh, earlier used to be an absolute indication for tracheal intubation. At least in some situations, people are allowing the emergency use of a laryngeal mask. But please remember, always use a second generation device. That is a ProSeal or eye gel or a Supreme or one or, or again, or one of those devices, not the first generation original laryngeal mask design. The other thing that has evolved is laryngoscopy. Now, you know, almost till 2005, so the first laryngoscope was described somewhere in the 1940s. So almost for 50, 60 years, there was not much advance in the way we did laryngoscopy. And that was the key to intubation, isn't it? To get that tongue out of the way, to get the, uh, to expose the vocal cords and get the tube in. I mean, you needed a laryngoscope to do all that. But there was almost no change in the design of the laryngoscope for many, many years. Of course, we had the McCoy, which, you know, sort of uh, lifted the epiglottis a bit more. But I mean, I've never been very impressed by the McCoy. We had the Bullard, which was something like that. But the real thing came is when we had video laryngoscopes come in. 
Video laryngoscopes, they put a camera at the tip of the laryngoscope and one of the first was the glide scope. And after that, you've got a lot of different types of uh, video laryngoscope, the micra, the CMAC, which many of us would believe is the most series of uh, video laryngoscope. And you have so many more. So essentially, a video laryngoscope has a camera at the tip of the uh, end of the blade. And it directly sees it is very close to the larynx and it gives you a view of the larynx and the vocal cords which you see on a monitor over here. Okay. And because of the way the camera is and the technology of the cameras, you get a very nice uh, viewing angle. You don't need to give the sniffing position to look at the tube because the angle, uh, the tip of the blade just sees everything. Okay, And you watch the monitor and you put the endotracheal tube in. So now you're almost like a surgeon doing laparoscopy. You're just looking at the monitor and you're fiddling around with the tube and it's sort of going into the trachea. So this is a tremendous exam uh, advance. With our standard direct laryngoscopy, you had to have to retract, give the position to align all the axes, okay? And then you'd have to retract the tongue and pull the tissues up. And so in a standard laryngoscopy, you'd have a sort of direct view from your, your line of sight across the larynx towards the vocal cords. That's why that is called direct laryngoscopy. And what you do see with a video laryngoscope is called indirect laryngoscopy because you're not in the line of sight at all. What you're seeing is an image captured by the camera on your monitor and you're trying to guide your tube into the uh, larynx, okay? Now, when we say video laryngoscope, you know, please remember there are now Video laryngoscopes and there are different well, and there are video laryngoscopes. There are a whole range of video laryngoscopes. Very broadly, you can say that some are channeled, non-channeled, just like the Mac plate, and some are channeled. So you can actually, uh, you know, guide the endotracheal tube along the channel of the of the blade towards the larynx. You have the Macintosh type of blade, the standard Macintosh type of blade, or you can have a hyperangulated blade, which has a much sharper uh, bend. And you've got different types of screen at different positions. And you also have all costs that are covered. You have very low cost uh, video laryngoscopes. You know, you can even make a one somewhat to yourself by ordering that uh, fiber, fiber optic cable from Amazon and clipping it on, sticking it onto your uh, Macintosh, direct running Macintosh blade. And then you have something like a homemade or a do-it-yourself video laryngoscope. And there are many of those varieties also around. There are Indian companies which give cheap laryngoscope, which costs anywhere from 20,000, 50,000, 1 lakh, 2 lakhs. And you have got the high class or the high performance, uh, highly expensive ones like the CMAC or the Glidescope or something like that. So depending on your budget, you can actually buy, you can have a video laryngoscope that suits your pocket, that suits the purpose and helps your patients. So I think in this day and age, uh, getting a video laryngoscope is not a huge problem. Of course, you may not get the top end one, but you will definitely, you may not get a Mercedes, but you'll certainly get a Maruti. And, and you will definitely not have to do with a Bell Gardi, right? So I'm sure we can all do this in us, wherever we are. Okay. The problem with the video laryngoscopes is a small problem, but you know, like I said, that with the Macintosh blade, everything is a line of sight. So if you can see the cords, then if you put the endotracheal tube, it will follow the line of sight and intubation is then not very difficult if you can see the cords. The problem in most of the time with the Mac blade is you can't see the cords, right? And that's because the larynx is up anterior. With the Mac blade, okay, with the video laryngoscope blade, the camera sees the larynx and the cords very easily. However, it is not in the line of sight, especially with the hyperangulated blade where the angle is even more steep and this is not in the line of sight. And therefore, very often with the video laryngoscopes, they say that oh, my view was fantastic, but the intubation was difficult. Laryngoscopy was easy, but the intubation was difficult. And that's because we have to understand that we have, especially with the hyperangulated blade like this, you have to get the tube to traverse this this angle which is which the video laryngoscope is seen, right? And that can happen if you have a shaped stillet. So with especially with the hyperangulated blade, you must have a shaped stillet which is shaped like a hockey stick so that you can put it into the trachea. You can do that also with a Macintosh type of video laryngoscope blade. Uh, but so keep that in mind that you need a shaped stillet when you're doing, especially when you're using a hyperangulated blade.
it is also worth remembering that just because you are experienced at standard direct laryngoscopy doesn't mean you'll be good at video laryngoscopy. You need to train, you need to do video laryngoscopies in standard, in easy patients before you try and fool around doing something in a difficult patient. But having said that, a video laryngoscopy is tremendously improves your view, tremendously increases your intubation success rate. And there's this very large uh, meta-analysis of many, many trials of almost 26,000 patients, 220 trials. And all of them have shown the overall that video laryngoscopes of any design reduce the rate of failed intubation. Okay, so failed intubation is much less common now with the advent of video laryngoscopes. And it can come down by half. The rate of failed intubation has come down by half or even more than that in some cases. Okay. Increased rates of successful intubation in first attempt, so you don't keep on uh, poking around. Better glottic views, because that's exactly the way the video laryngoscope works. And the hyperangulated blades, okay, they, like the D blade of the CMAC, they reduce the rate of esophageal intubation and are more successful in patients who already have a difficult airway. So if you know that your patient has a difficult airway, maybe a hyperangulated blade is the blade of choice. Okay, so that's about the some of the tools that we are using. Now, no, we are all talking of managing the difficult airway. And even in 2022, the American Society of Anesthesiologists in the guidelines have defined a difficult airway, okay, as one in which you cannot do either face mask ventilation or laryngoscopy or ventilation using supraortic airway or intubation or extubation put an invasive airway. So again, these are all technical things, right? They are not able to do one of these few things when the patient is uh, apneic after we've given a muscle relaxation. So that's why the patient becomes at risk. So again, the problem is that we are always fixated only on the fact of whether a laryngoscopy will be easy or not, whether a tube will go or not, whether a supra airway, laryngeal mask will go or not. You know, those sort of things is what we are always worried about. But we also need to worry about a couple of other things. And one of those things which we need to worry about is risk of aspiration. Now, we've always said that this sort of patient at risk of aspiration, that sort of patient at risk of aspiration, pregnant patient, obese patient, patient who's had a trauma, they're all at high risk of aspiration. But today, with gastric ultrasound, we can quantify and objectively decide whether our patient is at risk of aspiration or not. So if you put your uh, probe, abdominal ultrasound probe, yeah, just over here in the uh, subcostal region below the xiphoid cartilage. Okay, and you look for the liver and you look for the uh, stomach, the gastric antrum is what you're sort of uh, looking at. If you get a small collapsed antrum, that means your stomach is empty. If you get a dilated antrum, okay, but you got what this is called as the starry night up here. You got... You can just imagine there is a cavity with some chunks of food inside it. Okay, so that's a gastric antrum. That's the antrum over here. This is a pancreas. So then, or if you get what is called a frosted glass open, all this tells you there's solid material in the stomach. And that is dangerous. And this is a stomach which is distended, the antrum which is distended, but it's got liquid material in it. So this has got, so you can actually, and you can actually measure the cross-sectional area of the gastric antrum and quantify how much fluid is there. So this is again an advance. It takes the empiricism of deciding whether a patient is full stomach or not. And you can then decide whether to do a rapid sequence intubation or not do a rapid sequence intubation or avoid a general IC or ensure that you put a cuffed endotracheal tube in if the risk of aspiration is high. So I think gastric ultrasound is another important thing which we are going to use more and more to quantify the risk of aspiration. So the other thing, the other problem is again, like I said, we we induce, we give a relaxant, produce apnea, and then our idea of difficulty is that you're not able to do any of these things, right? And that's when you call it as a difficult airway. And then it leads to hypoxia, hypotension, and you know, either death or brain damage. That's been our idea of difficult intubation. But you know, in order to give us time to intubate, we pre-oxidate the patient. So when you pre-oxidate the patient, the functional residual capacity gets filled with oxygen. So the nitrogen is replaced by oxygen. And that gives you, instead of normal, when you make the patient apneic, it gives you about seven to eight minutes of apnea. If you did not pre-oxidate, you'd probably get about two minutes of apnea. So pre-oxygenation makes the, uh, <coughs> increases the ability of the patient to withstand apnea without getting seriously hypoxic. So basically it prolongs 
the safe apnea time. So our defense to give us time to do all these procedures is to prolong the apnea time, the safe apnea time by the act of pre-oxygenation, right? Now, there are some situations where pre-oxygenation is not effective. And even if you hold a 100% face mask on the patient for five minutes, you will not get a sufficient rise in the arterial PO2. There will not, even if the, uh, and you will find this patient desaturating much earlier and not tolerating apnea, okay? So, for example, if I say I've, let's say I've got a uh, Severe, uh, but very obese patient who's also pregnant. So, because of the weight of the fat and the weight of the uterus, the lungs have become very small, right? They collapse. So, the FRC is very low. So, even if I replace the entire FRC with oxygen, the FRC itself is so reduced that there is not enough oxygen store or an oxygen reservoir in the lung. And this patient will decompensate or become hypoxic very fast in less than a minute, maybe after you paralyze the patient. Therefore, you do not have an adequate safe interval to do all your procedures. And this is what we call as a physiologically difficult time. So even in some patients where the, the intubation by itself may not be difficult, the physiological conditions or the pathophysiology of the patient that does not allow adequate pre-oxygenation, does not allow the PO2 to, to come up and fill the FRC with uh, the, and reduces the FRC, that results in what we call as a physiologically difficult time. So if you see these curves, this is the oxygen saturation here. This is a time of apneic time in minutes. A normal patient, you know, 70 kilo, but you get about eight minutes of apnea before the patient starts desaturating to below 90%. Okay. If you have a moderately critically ill patient, say someone with perforation peritonitis, that interval comes down to about four minutes, less than four to five minutes. If you have a child who also has a very low FRC, okay, that a normal child has just about over three minutes. And even obese patient, it's just about two, less than three minutes, two to two and a half minutes. And a little more time is lost, the saturation goes down to 85%. So as the patient gets sicker, as the FRC becomes smaller, the, there is more is the risk of hypoxia because then your safe apnea time is now cut down. And like I said, this obese patient is also pregnant or this patient with perforation pride is also obese or he had, had a lung injury or acute or an ARDS because of uh, sepsis. Then this time could be even one minute or even less than a minute. So they would desaturate extremely rapidly. And this is what you call as a physiologically difficult time. So now the challenge is in all these patients, we have to improve the oxygenation. And we all know, yeah, yeah, we all say, yes, yes, we have to improve oxygenation. And the question is, how do we improve oxygenation in, in these sort of patients? Okay. And it is very embarrassing to learn that, you know, this tool of apneic oxygenation has been with us for years. The physiology of apneic oxygenation has been described at least for the last, uh, since the 1940s or 1950s. It's only now that we've started using apneic oxygenation in our practice. And how, what, now, when you say apneic oxygenation, what, is, what do we say? What do we want to say? See, we can give oxygen in, by nose and it will, and if, when the patient is apneic, that oxygen, we often believe, will just stay in the dead space because you need ventilation, you need the lung movement to draw the air into the alveoli. So the question is, when I give oxygen to the nose, through the nose or through the mouth in an apneic patient, will that oxygen reach the alveoli, because that is where oxygenation will take place. If it stays in the dead space in the trachea and bronchi, it's not going to improve oxygenation. So actually, if you give oxygen at a flow rate of at least 15 liters per minute through the nose or mouth, it will enter the alveoli. And for a, for a simple physiological mechanism, is that you see the oxygen is there in the alveoli, right? And oxygen is taken up into the blood, right? That's how, that's what it is meant for. So oxygen is taken up by the blood. So about 250 ml of oxygen is consumed. It's taken up from the blood. It goes to the tissues. In the tissues, you get carbon dioxide production when the metabolism takes place. Now, about 200 ml of oxygen per minute uh, of carbon dioxide are produced. So 250 ml of oxygen go out. 200 ml of carbon dioxide are produced. And even those 200 ml don't come back into the alveolus. Less than 200 comes in because carbon dioxide is equilibrated and buffered in the tissues. And therefore, very little ox carbon dioxide comes back into the lung. Okay. And that means more oxygen is going out. So more gas is going out of the alveolus than gas coming into the alveolus. Right. And that means there is a negative pressure 
small negative pressure being created. And if you give oxygen at a reasonably high flow of about 15 liters per minute, this oxygen will get sucked into the alveolus and it will now start taking part in gas exchange with ox because oxygen has now got into the lung. So apneic oxygenation is extremely effective to raise the FIO2, provide the alveoli are open. So the simple nasal cannula, okay, the simple nasal cannula connected to a cylinder or to another source of oxygen in, the, in your anesthesia machine, but giving it at about 15 liters per minute will improve oxygenation. So apneic oxygenation should be done in all patients in whom you are doing laryngoscopy. And our All India Difficult Airway Guidelines actually say that you should give 15 liters of oxygen through a nasal cannula when you're doing intubation. So in case, so you have, you can increase your safe apnea time from in a normal patient of seven to eight minutes to much more, uh, maybe 10, 12, 15 minutes, okay? In addition, we now have another fantastic tool called high flow nasal oxygen or what we call as Thrive, I'll talk about that. But high flow nasal oxygen is you give oxygen at a flow rate of 60 to 70 liters per minute. Now, because oxygen is going at such a high flow rate, you know, it has to be warmed and humidified and you need this excellent uh, humidification system over here. Originally, this was given by Fisher and Pekel, but now many companies are sort of giving this technology. And then you have a face mask, a circuit which maintains the heat heating, and then this uh, nasal cannula, which clips onto the nose and gives you a very nice humidified, heated oxygen at high flow of 60 to 70 liters per minute. Okay, and Thrive now stands for a transnasal humidified rapid insufflation ventilatory exchange. So not only will it give oxygen by apneic oxygenation, but it will also increase, eliminate CO2. That's why it's called ventilatory exchange. Okay, so this is continuous transnasal high flow, humidified and warmed oxygen. You can give pre-oxygenation and when the patient is paralyzed, you can continue it during the apneic period and maintain oxygenation, okay? And this was a very nice study, one of the first studies which was described using laryngeal surgery, but they were giving Thrive through the nose at 70 liters per minute. And you can see the median apnea time before the saturation dropped to 90% was 15 minutes, 14 to 15 minutes. So from seven to eight minutes, you've now come to 14 to 15 minutes. And some patients went to 20 minutes, some patients went to 30 minutes, and one patient went beyond 60 minutes. So now can you imagine if you've given Thrive or 60 liters or 70 liters of 100% oxygen through the nose using that system, you have 15 minutes to intubate your patient. And if you have any trouble, any trouble at this point in time, all you, you have enough time to call someone, get some help, get some more equipment, you know, and not worry about your patient dying on you because of hypoxia. So this is a huge advance in the safety of airway management. Remember, there is one caveat. You have to start this from the beginning. Once you have hypoxia and the patient has already started, alveoli started collapsing and the patient started becoming hypoxic, and then you put it, then this is not going to work well. So this has to be done from the beginning and then it gives you a very nice increase in the safe apnea time. So this is something which will also make airway management much, much safer. Now, you know, the, we say that normally the PCO2 rises by about three to six milliliters of mercury per minute, right? Uh, during standard apneic oxidation, because there the carbon dioxide is not getting washed out because the lungs are not moving. But with Thrive, they found that the rate of rise of PCO2 is only a little more than one millimeter of mercury per minute. And that is because there is some gas exchange also going on, which is eliminating some CO2. So it doesn't rise as fast as it rises with standard 10 or 15 liters uh, oxygen flow. Okay, so there is some ventilatory exchange going on. So now once you have these sort of concepts coming in, okay, the modern rapid sequence induction or modern intubation is you pre-oxygenate, you know, and you can give either high flow nasal oxygen and in patients in whom the functional nasal capacity is reduced, like someone with ARDS, maybe even some obese patients, you can give CPAP or a non-invasive ventilation with PEEP to increase the FRC, right? Then you induce anesthesia and then once you've induced and given the muscle relaxant, you start giving nasal oxygen, either nasal oxygen at 15 liters per minute or Thrive, that is a high flow nasal oxygen, okay? So now you've got oxygenation starting from pre-oxygenation, continuing after you give the relaxant, you're doing a laryngoscopy, 
if you want to give cricoid pressure, you give cricoid pressure. But now people say that, well, if cricoid pressure is hampering your view, then you release the cricoid pressure if, you, if that's what you're giving. Okay. You give your muscle relaxant. After relaxant is given, you continue thrive. So throughout your intubation sequence, you've got nasal oxygen at 15 liters or high flow nasal oxygen going on. In patients who got a full stomach, earlier we used to say no IPPV, but now they allow you to give gentle IPP with the pop-off valve going up to off at 20, 15 to 20 centimeters of water. So that again improves the safety of uh, intubation. Okay, and then you intubate and you uh, release the cricoid pressure or confirm intubation. Okay, so this is now called what we call as peri oxygenation or per oxygenation or peri intubation oxygen. So throughout the intubation sequence, oxygen is going on, and that will. This is such a simple concept, and this will greatly in increase the safety of uh, intubation or airway management. So just this giving nasal oxygen throughout the intubation period is something which we should do to make life easier for ourselves. Now, you have to confirm that your tube is in the trachea, because in an apneic patient, if they put the tube in the esophagus, it's not a good thing, right? It's going to be a disaster. And uh, there's enough evidence and there's so much science that the capnograph is the best way to demonstrate a, a an esophageal intubation. So you have to confirm intubation, tracheal intubation or diagnose esophageal intubation. The capnograph is the in instrument to do. Everything else is secondary and inferior. Okay. The only sure shot thing of doing is a capnograph. And you know, that's uh, everyone says, but we don't have capnograph and uh, I don't have a capnograph here. And what about rural and remote areas? And what about uh, those sort of things? But the cost of a capnograph today is half the cost of a family holiday that you take. So you can easily get it over there. Secondly, there are places where people use capnographs because a surgeon is doing laparoscopy. You want to monitor the patient during laparoscopic surgery by using a capnograph. But in that same place, they will you will not use a capnograph to confirm tracheal intubation. I think we need to get out of this. We must use capnography to confirm tracheal intubation. And uh, you know, the the ISA Private Practitioners Forum is going to lay, have a guideline to have capnography in the OT to confirm uh, tracheal intubation. And the idea is that you can use these guidelines to convince hospital managements and surgeons and nursing homes to get this equipment in the OT. You know, it's not something you should we should be carrying around, but uh, it is something which uh, people... Uh, hospital owners and nursing homeowners have to sort of start doing and we have to make this move you know i don't say you have to have it tomorrow but maybe in the next one year two years three years every operating area where intubation is done must have a capnograph okay and the consequences and even today even today in 2023-24 people are still losing patients because they are not looking at either not using capnography or not using it correctly. So to know that the tube is going to trachea, you must have what we call a sustained exhaled carbon dioxide was we see. So it must be more than 7.5 millimeters of mercury and it must be sustained. Okay. Or it must be increasing with every breath. Okay. If it is not very low amplitude, if the amplitude is falling, right, or it's very low, right, then it means that this tube is not in the trachea. It is in the esophagus and like we used to have in our old days, the visual maxim, when in doubt, take it out. Okay, But if, let's say, your intubation was very difficult and you struggled and you thought you had the tube in and you think the tube is in the trachea, but your capnograph is not, is not coming properly, it probably means it is not in the trachea. But you are, you know, uh, you don't want to take it out for a small chance that it may be in the trachea. Then you have to take active steps to exclude yourself the intubation, provided the SPO2 is okay. Right, and so you must either do a video laryngoscopy or a bronchoscopy or some other esophageal detector device or ultrasound. If you don't have any of these, just take the tube out and start all over again and ventilate by face mask. Okay, so this is how a video laryngoscope. We talked about video laryngoscopy. This is how a video laryngoscope can help you see where the tube is. Right, so here on all these, you can see the tube is clearly not in the trachea and it's gone behind, and only you've not been able to see it very clearly. The other advantage of a video laryngoscope is when you're doing a scopy and you're putting a tube in, someone else can also see, and both of you can visually confirm that the tube has gone through the vocal cords. Okay, so this is another very important thing that we need to do 
to prevent esophageal intubation. Okay, now let's say you've tried everything and the tube has just not gone in and you landed up in real, real trouble because you've not been able to intubate, you've not been able to ventilate by any means, whether it's face mask or laryngeal mask or whatever it is. And then you're looking at this sort of situation where, you know, you're really on the verge of losing the patient. And therefore, we now have to look at rescue airway techniques and the rescue airway technique, which now people are advocating is a surgical picotherotomy. Okay, and there's here you, you do what is called the scalpel bougie tube technique. So you locate the cricothyroid membrane, make a nick in the cricothyroid membrane, turn the blade around, put a bougie, and put a tube, a five, a five and a half or six number endotracheal tube over it. The advantage of this technique is all this material is available in every OT, right? And, you know, you don't have to run around looking for special kits or special equipment. Although if you have those kits, that's different, but very often they are not available, but this sort of thing is available in every OE. The problem is we have a psychological barrier to doing a cricotherapy. We are more likely to shout to the surgeon, Are tracheostomy karo, you know, and we are less likely to pick up a knife and do this sort of procedure because simply we are not trained. We are psychologically also not trained, right, to pick up a knife. But I think we need to change this mindset and we need to practice surgical cricotherapy in workshops, on animal models, on dummies, to just to know how to do this tube because this is a life-saving technique and this is something we must be able to do. Can you imagine that you are in a gynec theater doing a cesarean or with a pregnant patient okay, and you're not able to intubate the trachea? Okay? The gynecologist is not going to be able to help you do a tracheostomy, right? The gyne gynecologist in 10 seconds will do an episiotomy. But a tracheostomy or a cricothyrotomy, you have to do. And please remember the cricothyrotomy is the fastest procedure which takes less than 30 seconds. A tracheostomy takes very long, unless the surgeon is highly experienced and very good or, and lucky also. Okay, So always remember, when you are in this kind of situation, the procedure of choice is a surgical cricothyrotomy and not a tracheostomy. And we have to practice getting a tracheostomy. The other way out of this is to reverse the relaxant, provided as rocuronium or vacuronium, and you're going to have a talk on this afterwards. So I'm not going to go into it, except to say that Sigomedex is one more option we have to rapidly reverse even a deep neuromuscular block with a high dose. And then we can hopefully be, be able to save our patient. Okay. The last part is I say, you know, we have all talked about trying not to get into disaster, but what have we learned from airway disasters, right? So we, so I think this is one of the most brilliant papers it's not a randomized controlled trial. It did not come in the JAMA or the New England Journal of Medicine. It was published in the British Journal of Anesthesia. But it is one of the most informative and the most important papers that I think every anesthetist should intubate. So I manages the airway should read. And this is the fourth national audit project, or they call it NAP4, of the Royal College of Anesthetists. Okay? And this looked at all the airway disasters that happened in one year's period in the UK, in all the NHS hospitals. And there were 184 airway disasters which led to death or brain damage and 133 happened in the OT. So the incidence was not very high. It was one per 22,000 general anesthetics. Okay, difficult airway. That included not just intubation, it included difficulties with face mask ventilation, laryngeal mask insertion, all those things. Anesthesia events led to 16 deaths and three episodes of permanent brain damage. So that's 19 out of 184 had death or permanent brain damage when you looked at. So almost 10%, if you had a difficult airway disaster, 10%, almost 10% of your patients either died or had brain damage. The mortality rate was 1 in 180,000. And these three lines are the most important. The airway management was considered good in only 19% of patients. Elements of care were judged to be poor in 75%. So even though there were qualified anesthetists in the UK managing these patients, in the patients who had a disaster, elements of care were poor in 75% of these things, okay? And very importantly, human factors relating to the individual or the team were present in 40% of cases. And there was poor judgment in 56% of cases and inadequate teamwork in 14%. Now, you know, this means like poor judgment means, you know, we always think we can intubate every patient. It doesn't matter. Balaji could not intubate that patient, I can intubate because, you know, he's state president, I'm national president. So just because he failed, I will be doubly shut out to do that case with a long acting muscle relaxant because I think I can do it. So this is poor judgment, right? So this sort of thing is a psychology is there in all of us, in many of us. 
okay and these can lead to a very poor outcome now you can say teamwork where is the teamwork for a solo anesthetist is working in a ot in a nursing home but you know all around you is a team right you're the you got the ward boy or the mama who's there who's probably been there for 30 years and you know he knows everything is the nurse who's been there for many years the surgeon is there so they form your team and you have to get them to help you and you know get the things going over there so so these are the things which we do so basically the focus is now apart from you have to be skilled you have to know how to intubate how to manage the airway how to hold a laryngeal mask how to do a cricothorotomy you have to know all that but at the end of the day it is the human factors the psycho psychological factors how you behave under stress what you do when things are going wrong that is what is also going to lead to adverse outcome and that is the importance of simulation and uh, all those sort of things which go on which help you look at your non technical skills and i think this nap for has focused heavily on non technical skills and the barriers and the psychological human factors that prevent you from doing the right things when you are faced with a stressful situation so you have to of course teach train you have to be good technically because even if you know everything about a video learning scope you can't handle one then you are of no use to anyone right but also now you have to learn about non technical skills situational awareness what to do when things go wrong communication teamwork and organization and lastly i'll talk about the guidelines there are many many guidelines that have come out the, a lot of favorite uh, favorite of many is the das or the difficult airway society guidelines in the uk we now in 22 the latest ones are the american society the asa algorithm guidelines and we had the indian guidelines from the all india difficult airway so association which we published in 2016 and we published guidelines on unanticipated unanticipated intubation and difficult in adults in obstetrics in pediatrics we also published guidelines for extubation and for intubation in the ic so five guidelines we published in that issue of ij and we also had a sort of step step wise approach and you know i'll tell you where the big differences that we had from the uk guidelines so it was not a cut copy paste in fact we differed with the uk guidelines quite significantly so the uk guidelines said you know if you are not able to intubate not able to ventilate okay then you have to do what is called declare kico c i c o or you can call it kico subordinate kico or what now in bombay in our bombay or hindi if you say kaiko then you know the answer to is h that's mere ko man mein aaya marzi aaya isliye kiya you know so kaiko so so kaiko doesn't make much sense it stands for cannot intubate cannot oxygenate apart from the fact that it is pronounced in different ways and it means different things to different people what do you mean or cannot intubate is easy what do you mean by cannot oxygenate so when will you see a patient is not oxygenating when the saturation is 95% will you say he's not not cannot oxygenate now remember you have failed to intubate you have failed to ventilate by face mask laryngeal mask whatever but the saturation is 95% is this cannot oxygenate is 90% cannot oxygenate or is 70% cannot oxygenate so we don't so what do you mean by cannot oxygenate right so that is one problem and you know why we have to know cannot oxygenate because you have to rescue this patient this patient is going to die very soon right so a failed airway results first in failure to ventilate the lungs and that results in failure to oxygenate the patient right and that's when you get hypoxia now should you do a cricothoracotomy or some surgical rescue when the saturation is okay but you know you fail to ventilate by all means and this is inevitable should you early or should you wait till the patient cannot oxygenate becomes hypoxic and then do a rescue i think it makes sense you know that you should move to emergency access early rather than late once you know that you fail to ventilate the patient at all right so you can do your thing with a little more safety and a little more precision a little more calmness at this stage than when then somewhere at this stage so i think cannot oxygenate is also keeps people off because there is no no saturation 95% so i don't need to do a cricothoracotomy i don't need to worry about rescue in half a minute the patient will come down to a 80% saturation then your hands will shake and you won't be able to do anything okay so we say that this situation where you cannot do ventilate the patient you cannot intubate you cannot use a face so is we call it as complete ventilation failure okay and it is important to recognize this because ventilation failure precedes oxygenation failure and as soon as you have complete ventilation you have to call for additional help okay and go ahead with the cricothoracotomy even if oxygen appears to be okay because now the oxygen is surely going to go down and you need to move to a rescue okay so our guidelines stress the importance of oxygenation you know many guidelines say you should take three attempts at intubation then do something else we say you take two or three attempts but 
you must have a saturation of more than 95% to take multiple attempts. Okay. We recommended that nasal oxygen be given continuously at a flow rate of at least 15 liters per minute throughout the period of activity. And I, like I mentioned, we talked about complete ventilation failure. The problem with all guidelines across the world is, you know, that we may have guidelines here, but then very wide uh, uh, variation in the education and practice of airway management. And if we say something, someone may not be familiar with that. Okay. So, and of course, availability of equipment, cost and all that is a factor. And everyone doesn't know all the, all the guidelines and some people don't know, are just not aware of these things. So we need to have a plan to disseminate the guidelines and see that people follow at least some of these things. So I think it is now at the end in 2024, you know, like initially in, when we were uh, practicing in the 80s and 90s, we had a, our plan A was intubation. That was very strong. We always hoped with the laryngeal mask, we had a plan B. But we had very little to do with plan C and D. But today, with our current techniques, technology and knowledge that we have, we have very strong plan A. We have also equally strong plan B, a plan C, okay, with cigar medics. And we should have a plan D, that is to rescue. And please remember that now we say per oxygenation or peri-intubation oxygen must continue throughout. Okay, so I'll just end by saying that, you know, today, we are doing this. We've got good drugs. We are pre-oxygenating. Okay. We've got, we are better off than what we were in 1985. We now have bougie stilets, video laryngoscopes, different types of supraortic AV devices. We know how to do cricotherotomy. We have something to reverse muscle relaxants, but we must keep in mind that you pre-oxygenate with Thrive or NIV or CPAP. Give oxygenation throughout. So peri-intubation oxygenation is extremely important and hopefully we'll have better outcomes. So this is just a small flyer about the World Congress, which is happening in March 3rd to 7th. I hope many of you are there and presenting our work. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Devati, sir. It was a very nice lecture with a deep uh, study and uh, recent advances. I think we will uh, we'll go for a question and answer after uh, Sujit's lecture. So I would like to go ahead with the Sujit Khadis lecture. I would like to request uh, Dr. Sujata Man to introduce Sujit Khadis. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, now we have, after a, a phenomenal talk by Dr. Divatiya, sir, we have next eminent speaker and my own senior as well as teacher, Dr. Sujit Khadis, sir. Sir is a consultant cardiac and neuroanesthesiologist as well as director of Ozone Anesthesia Group, thus catering various cardiac and neuro centers, corporate hospitals, and many institutes in Aurangabad. Sir is a recipient of ISA National Diligent Award 2022. Sir has received Maharashtra State Chapter President Appreciation Award twice and many conferences award. With the academic excellence, Sir being on the faculty at various conferences. With the same zeal, Sir runs Ozone Learning Academy. On every Wednesday, webinar has been conducted under Sir's leadership. He does this with so much of passion that I'm sure all his me time and family time has been utilized in making this YouTube videos, uh, editing those videos and uploading the, uh, them so that it reaches to each and every anesthesiologist. I've been groomed under Sir's leadership and have closely observed Sir's skill and learn many more things from sir. Sir has expertise in regional anesthesia, pediatric vascular access, advanced vascular access, interventional pain management. Sir is very much digital friendly and techno savvy person. You name it and sir is there with his experience and expertise. I welcome you Dr. Suchit Khare sir on this prestigious platform of uh, SAMS to talk on versatile reversal agent, which every anesthesiologist must know in depth. Welcome sir. Thank you, Sujata. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening, respected National President Divatiya, sir. Sam's President, Dr. Balaji, sir. Secretary, Dr. Tagadballe, sir. Dr. Manisha Kartikar, madam. All the office bearers, my seniors and dear friends. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thank Sam's for the opportunity. After 178 years of first ever demonstration of ether anesthesia by Dr. W.T.G. Morton, now we are discussing about versatile reversal agent. We are almost there, but yet to have a most versatile reversal agent 
available for clinical use. It is interesting to see the timeline of anesthesia drugs, which include neuromuscular blocking agents and their reversal agents. On the 16th October 1846, on the ether day, Dr. Warren, who was 68 at that time, and Dr. Morton, who was 28, had together successfully performed the first surgery with general anesthesia. And Dr. Warren successfully excised a neck tumor. Till then, what was available for anesthesia was morphine, cocaine for topical use, nitrous oxide, which was used widely in dentistry. Within a span of one year, we had two potent anesthetic agents, which ruled for next almost 100 years. They were ether and chloroform. Evolution of neuromuscular blocking agents began with d tubocurorin in 1942, which was inspired by Amazon Indian poisonous arrows. And succinous choline came into clinical use in 1951. In next 50 years till 2000, we had various non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents like pancuronium, which was introduced in 1964, vicuronium, which was introduced in 1984, which replaced existing non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. Then came atacurium and cisatracurium, which were introduced in 1981 and 1999, which are benzylosoquinilonium neuromuscular blocking agents. Then quick onset neuromuscular blocking agents were developed. The most important one is rocuronium, which was introduced in 1994. Even after 150 years of first successful demonstration of ether anesthesia, till 2000, what we had for reversal of neuromuscular blocking agent was acetylcholinesterase inhibitor neostigmine for all practical purposes, despite its drawbacks. The only two other clinical available anticholinesterases are pyridostigmine and adrophonium. In 2008, new reversal agent was approved for use in Europe and which is launched in India recently, last year only, that is Sugamatix. Can we call it a versatile reagent? Surely not, but it has some advantages which we'll, we see soon. The broad spectrum reversal agent, universal for all neuromuscular blocking agents, capable of reversing any depth of neuromuscular block is undergoing human clinical trials, and this can be a really versatile reversal agent. We can hope to have it soon for our clinical use. With the ample availability of short-acting neuromuscular blocking agents, which undergo Hoffman's degradation like atracurium and cisatracurium, should we reverse neuromuscular block at the end of surgery? We need to answer this question. This paper, published in 2007 by Mayhor and his colleagues, tried to find the incidence and duration of residual paralysis at the end of surgery after multiple administration of cisatracurium and rocuronium. They found out the incidence of residual paralysis was significantly lower in patients treated with rocuronium as compared to that of cisatracurium. This means 57% of the patients who received cisatracurium and 44% of those receiving rocuronium had residual neuroaxial block leading to respiratory paralysis. This is quite a high number. This article published in 2013 investigated the residual neuromuscular block in elderly patients and found that post-residual curarization was more frequent in elderly than younger patient. They concluded that residual paralysis remains a major problem in geriatric clinical anesthesia. Neuromuscular function monitoring is obligatory and pharmacological reversal of relaxation should be advised in geriatric patients after using relaxants for general anesthesia. Next question to be answered is, should a PNS be used in all patients giving neuromuscular agents? We all are using five second head rates tongue protrusion, eye opening, cuffing, and adequacy of tidal volume as qualitative predictors of neuromuscular block. 
we are not using pns to check neuromuscular block with train of 4 but this article which was published in 2017 found that train of 4 of 0.9 was considered necessary to protect the airway from aspiration before tracheal extubation it was also considered that 4 not 2 twitches of the train of 4 should be detectable before neostigmine was given so far, we have answered two important questions and we are sure that we should be reversing all patients who have received neuromuscular block and we should use PNS to assess the neuromuscular block. Now, let's find, find out which versatile reversal agent we have for the reversal of these agents. The versatile reversal agent should have following characteristics like it should be fast acting and there should not be any sealing effect. It should be efficient at any time. So what does it mean that at any time? It means even if I have given rocurinium for a difficult intubation and I am not able to intubate the patient, then this reversal agent should immediately reverse the neuromuscular block. There should be complete reversal. The half-life of the reversal agent should be longer than the half-life of neuromuscular blocking agent. It should reverse any neuromuscular blocking agent, whether it is a vacuronium or it is atracurium. There should not be any adverse cardiovascular effects or muscarinic effects, histamine release or the risk of anaphylaxis. And above all, it should have a low cost. So let's check available reversal agents on these yardsticks of ideal reversal agent. Pharmacological reversal of neuromuscular blockage began in 1950 with the carbamate group. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitor neostigmine, which we all are using since 1950. Indirect inaction, neostigmine cannot reverse profound neuromuscular block. It may induce muscle weakness if injected in large doses subsequent to recovery from neuromuscular blocking agent. It is called as post-operative recurization, resulting in post-operative respiratory complications. Bradycardia, arrhythmias, salivation, flushing, hypotension, and bronchospasm may result if not co-administrated with anticholinergics like atropine and glycoparate. Therefore, Neostigmine is far from a versatile reversal agent, but it has a very low allergic potential and it is very low cost drug. With these two virtues and unavailability of other options for reversal, it has been used for last 90 years or so. Sugamadex, which is introduced recently in India, directly inactivates steroidal non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents like vacuronium or rocurinium by effective encapsulation. It provides faster reversal of neuromuscular block. Reversal is not affected by blood pH and temperature. This means that Sugamadex is effective in acidotic or hypothermic patient. It has a lipophilic cavity and a hydrophilic exterior. It forms a tight complex with high association rate and very low dissociation rate. This picture shows how Sugamadex encapsulates rocurium forming a tight complex. Sugamadex is indicated in bariatric surgery and in morbidly obese patient posted for non-bariatric surgery. It can be best used for reversal of residual paralysis after neostigmine reversal. It will be useful in myasthenia gravis and muscular dystrophies. If we are using rocurinium for intubation, and in case of failed intubation or failed ventilation, Sugamadex can be used for rapid reversal of rocurinium. It can save our OT time by fast reversal in prematurely terminated operations. Then short surgeries like microlaryngeal surgeries. And it can be used when the uh, other reversal agents are contraindicated or ineffective. Sugamadex has relatively high anaphylaxis rate of 1 in 2,500 patients, around 0.39%. And because of this, it was not approved by US FDA till 2015. Sugamadex prolongs activated uh, partial thromboplastin time and prothrombin time, and it may cause oral contraceptive failure. Uh, Sugamadex is incompatible with ondansetron, verapamil, and ranitidine. 
if you consider the face value of neostigmine and sugamadex then obviously sugamadex is costly but we must consider the hidden cost incurred due to inadequate reversal and then we may find the hidden potential of sugamadex to save cost by preventing post operative respiratory complications this article which is published in 2021 tries to find out the economic impact of improving patient safety using sugamadex for routine reversal of neuromuscular blockage in spain the results are mind boggling the estimated budget impact of introduction of sugamadex to the routine reversal of neuromuscular blockage in spanish hospitals was net saving of 57 million euros annually an increase in drug acquisition cost was offset by savings in post operative pulmonary events including 4800 post operative pneumonias and almost 14000 cases of atelectasis the total cost of complications avoided was 70 million euros this is huge saving and we should not go only by face value of any reversal agent this sugamad this is the sugamadex dosing chart we do not use rocurium for difficult at our place we are not using rocurium for difficult intubation therefore practically we are using sugamadex for reversal of neuromuscular block at the end of the surgery so sugamadex with a dose of 2 mg per kg that is all you need in most of the cases but higher doses of 4 and 16 mg can be used for rapid reversal of neuromuscular block and it is equally effective considering all the advantages of sugamadex offers to us shall we hand over the trophy of being versatile reversal agent to sugamadex or shall we wait because its lipophilic cavity is not roomy enough to envelop the atracarium and cis atracarium so let's see the future competitors of sugamadex this chemistry professor lyle isaac established calabes biosciences after developing a novel group of molecular containers cal- called as calabadions to satisfy the market demand of us anesthesiologists i am surprised what strength these us anesthesiologists have that their demand is considered by someone in so uh, proficient in his job they have developed a brand new container calabadion with a much larger cavity than cyclotaxin that is sugamadex that can envelop and inactivate atracarium and cis atracarium as well this calabadion one is an acyclic glycouryl tetramercury cooker bit ureal container 90% of the calabadion one is renally excreted within 1 hour following injection of calabadion recovery time of train of 4 of 0.9 is only 84 second versus 6.2 minute for placebo 4.6 minute for neostigmine so it is faster than sugamadex Calabadion 2 can rapidly reverse vecuronium, rocuronium, cis-atracinium induced neuromuscular block in a dose-dependent manner much faster than sugamadex. Experiments on rats demonstrated that Calabadion 2 reverses etomidate and ketamine. So this is very important. Etomidate and ketamine anesthesia by chemical ens- encapsulation at non-toxic plasma concentrations. Above all, it also promises to reverse local anesthetics and can be useful to reverse local anesthetic toxicity so to conclude every neuromuscular block should be reversed quantitative objective neuromuscular monitoring should be included in the minimum monitoring standards sugamadex can reverse profound degree of rocuronium block and is better reversal agent than neostigmine considering post post operative complications of residual neuromuscular block sugamadex becomes cost effective by reducing post operative respiratory complications the broad spectrum reversal agent calabadion 2 stands out prominently since it does not only reverse any depth of neuromuscular block caused by any neuromuscular blocking agent but 
can also reverse general anesthetic induction agents and local anesthetic toxicity. This is very important. Like a broad spectrum antibiotics or antiarrhythmic agents, this new, the broad spectrum reversal agent calabidone 2 can be the most reverse, versatile reversal agent. Though it is not available for clinical use right now, but it is certainly staring at us from the horizon. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sujit sir. A very excellent talk and very crisp presentation. Um, can we have uh, some inputs from our president, sir, Dr. Balaji? Hello. Uh, yes, both <laughs> talks were excellent. First talk by Dr. Divatia, sir, was really very contemplative and it has thought poke and it has given so many good tips uh, to all of us. And second talk by Sujit is also very, very important. And uh, it has given us, a, uh, introduced us not only about Sukamedics, but a new uh, molecule which will come probably and which will be an ideal uh, reversal agent. Now, if there are any questions, I request all of you to put in chat blocks and someone should read or ask to the speaker. <laughs> uh, one question was there from Jesse, madam, to uh, I think Dr. Sujit, sir. Uh, what about the sealing effect of neostigmin? Uh... Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. As we all know that neostigmin is also having some <laughs> sealing effect. And if you give doses above 0 0.07 milligram per kg, not only there is a sealing effect, but itself it can cause uh, muscular weakness. So neostigmin is to be avoided in large doses. Uh, so, may I ask one? Yes, Can please, we uh, phase two, um, block, uh, Phase 2 block of uh, succinyl scoli? Can that be reverse? No, no. For uh, reversal of uh, phase 2 block, we cannot use Sugama Dex. But this new drug, Calabadian 2, mm -hmm. is promising to reverse the phase 2 block also. That's great. Mm -hmm. Any more questions from our participants? I'm very happy we were having more than 100 participants for today's activity. <laughs> uh, Dr. Lina wants to ask about availability. What availability, madam, you want to ask about Sugamadex or new drug? I think new drugs she wants to know. Now, these new drugs, they are not marketed yet, but they are, we are hoping that they will be available soon for clinical use, at least in uh, Europe and uh, US. As we all know that even uh, due to some regulatory problems, all these new drugs, they reach late in Indian market. So probably it will take some time, but I'm sure that in near future, we will be able to use this Calabadion 2 for reversal of not only neuromuscular block, but for reversal of uh, anesthetic agents like ketamine and etomid. One more question for you, I think, sir. Uh... If neostigmin is given already to reverse, then what about uh, the dose of sugamadex? Depending on the patient's weight, and uh, if you have uh, this train of four, uh, then you can see whether it is 0.9 or below. Then you can, depending on that, you can use either 2 milligram per kg or maybe 4 milligram per kg. Obviously, at the end of the surgery, you need not use a very high dose of 16 milligram per kg. It is reversed. It is reserved only for rocuronium dose, which was given for difficult intubation. And uh, after how much, how many, how much uh, time we can give after reversing with uh, neostigmin if the patient does not uh, breathe adequately or is inadequate reversal? When you can, as we know, as we know that neostigmin takes almost eight minutes for its action. So at least you should wait. 8 to 10 minutes to see whether neostigmin has given adequate action or not. And after that, if you think your patient is hypothermic, he is having some uh, low pH due to hypothermia or he already is a CKD patient, in that case, definitely you can use sugamadex maybe after 10 minutes. Okay. Even then also yeah. the dose of sugamadex remains the same, 2 milligram per kg? Or is there any reduction if in the dose? 
no 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 we can we have to give 2 mg per kg of uh, dose for reversal even after use of neostimib okay. thank you sir uh, there is one more question to rocuronium yes sir same same question for diabetes sir yeah yeah uh -huh. for divatia sir uh, should we use rocuronium in case of uh, anticipated difficult intubation If you have Sugamadex or if you don't have Sugamadex in hand. I think, I think so. we have lost connection with him. Actually, no, 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 no. Sorry, connection is there. No, no. Okay, yeah, can okay, you hear okay. me? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you are anticipating a difficult airway, I, I would suggest that uh, you either do an awake intubation or you use a short acting relaxant and use Ocarin if you have got Sugamadex. Okay. 16 milligram per kilo available with you. Oh. Because the problem when you use uh, rocuronium is that when you use it in the intubating dose of, uh, uh, you know, when you use it in the intubating dose of uh, 1.2 milligram per kilo, then your uh, apnea time is almost uh, eight, 60 to 90 minutes. And that is far too long to bail you out of patient. From that one, a success of eight minutes is to kill a patient if things are not going well, you know. So, depending on what is the difficulty and how serious the difficulty is and what is your assessment of the difficulty, one of the safest options is to an awake intubation. Otherwise, you give a short-acting muscle relaxant and you do that. Sir, shall I add to this thing? Good evening, everyone. Yes, oh, sir, good evening, Dr. Welcome, welcome, sir. Yeah, yeah. Well, sir is not feeling well. Still, he has joined. No, no, no. We are really yeah. thankful to him. Living on paracetamol. Anyway, uh, sir is absolutely correct. When the difficult airway intubation is anticipated, I think if you are already anticipating, you should have all the algorithms in your mind how to go about <laughs> it, rather than being adventurous in using the rocuronium. Now, coming to the even with the sugamadex in your hand, you don't know the variability. Uh, apnea time, okay, fine. It's a long time, but how can you get a reversal? Because the reversal will be variable in each and every patient. Depending on the patient's comorbidities, the pharmacological mechanism, the molecular pharmacological dynamics, they're different in different patients. And you may not be able to give more than three to four minutes in a difficult intubation when cannot intubate, cannot ventilate. In such type of situations, I think rather than being adventurous, I think go for the awake intubation. Rather than depending upon the typical copybook theoretical things, that reversal with the sugamadex is always available. So don't be uh, pseudo sure mm -hmm. about that thing that we will be able to maintain the airway or uh, we will be able to reverse the patient. <clears throat> and also I want to add that if by chance you do decide to give general anesthesia with a short-acting muscle relaxant, please make sure you've got your pre-oxygenation, nasal oxygen, thrive, uh, high flow nasal oxygen if you have it going because that is going to increase your margin of safety. Okay. So do everything to be safe. Make sure you've got adequate plan B and also uh, whether you're uh, and also prepare for the surgical airway, emergency surgical airway if that is the nature of the difficulty. You know, if it's an obstructed airway or if it's uh, some END case or something like that. You know, so have everything ready with you and don't uh, don't don't have bravado. That's the main thing. It's better to be humble than to be humbled. One more question for you, sir. Uh, which video laryngoscope you will uh, suggest? Or which video laryngoscope you will be branding? Conflict of interest, sir. I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> As president will be listened to the nation. You know, the nation will be listening to the no, president. No. The nation, this, no one listens to president. That is the whole problem in life. But no, no, yeah, <laughs> conflict of interest. There is a conflict of interest now. Even I want no. to listen. <laughs> so, see, if you... Like I said, you have to see, you have to A, use a video laryngoscope. Secondly, you have to see what suits your budget and what suits your need. And so in our hospital, we have also, we have, we've got uh, uh, the BPL video laryngoscope. I think many, some of you might be having the BPL one. We also have the CMAC. We also have the Beckrath. Okay. And uh, there are many in between also. The task scope is one some, some people are using. So, but... Uh, the idea is that you should have something with you which is over and above a uh, simple uh, direct laryngoscope, at least in this day and age. So there are lots of video laryngoscopes on the market and you can just choose 
one that fits your budget and your pocket and uh, you know whether you want it stationed in the ot or you want to carry it around wherever you go all those things you, you have to look at yeah. whether the screen is on remote whether you want it on the laryngoscope all those things you can figure out and uh, sir just add to it what we have experienced the setup you have got suppose the practitioners have got a different setup the academic institutions have got different setup see in where you can have a good learning curve at the earliest with uh, you try to do a workshop or try to attend some workshops or try to attend some sessions or a, wherever the training you see which type of video laryngoscope you are able to work comfortably i think go with that with your set of patients especially i think that's a way to go and always you keep a still at ready yeah when you're using a video laryngoscope so that uh, you don't uh, sometimes that getting it the it into the oral cavity and past the pharynx pharyngeal curve you ne sometimes need a still at in some patients so just keep that also in mind when you use a video laryngoscope yes so very informative still at uh, to keep have a still at handy while uh, doing intubation with video laryngoscope any more questions One question is there. Yeah, question uh, can we use brocodianum in the difficult intubation with Comte patient uh, where scoline is contraindicated? I think Sujit sir has already given an answer to this. Uh, or if the patient can is. Can I ask a question, madam? Uh, yes, yes like, ma'am. Uh, if uh, the sugar medex is been given for the failed intubation and the patient is reversed with sugar medex, so how long we should wait for that, that uh, surgery to be carried further? Like, how long that how long uh, the sugar medic uh, we should wait once the sugar medics is been given so that we can give the uh, further neuromuscular blocking agents so do you mean to say that uh, if uh, that difficult intubation was not possible but now we are able to intubate the patient and uh, after how much time we can give this uh, neuromuscular blocking agents no no once the patient is been reversed with sugar medic for the failed intubation okay Yes. Now, the surgery needs a, it's an urgent surgery and to be carried further. Like we again have to induce the patient and give neuromuscular blocking agent. So how long we should wait once the sugamatics has been given? Maybe Frankly speaking, I am not wait. aware of such situation where uh, after sugamatics, like uh, in uh, previously we used to reintubate the patient of tonsillectomy due to bleeding. So after giving neostigmine, we used to give another neuromuscular blocking mm -hmm. agent immediately. I think that should be the senior for Sugamadex also. Um, I think there is some time limit. Like uh, we have to wait a little longer, four to six hours. So we cannot inter do uh, restart the surgery. That's I think Divatia sir might be knowing the answer of this question. So, so I don't know the answer for sure, but... Uh, you know, the, you have to wait for the Sugavadex to clear the system. Otherwise, it'll, it'll gobble up even the new relaxant that you give. So, oh, maybe no. you use some other relaxant which which doesn't work uh, against which Sugavadex doesn't work. So, don't use... Like Atracurium or Cisatracurium. Yeah. 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 Yes. Use Atracurium. So, we can give Atracurium instead yeah. of Procurium. So, so, if you're in that kind of situation where you had reversed and now there is bleeding and you have to immediately, you know, Go ahead with uh, another surgery. You use a non uh, sugavadex uh, vulnerable agent like atracurum or cisatra. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I add something, Dr. Sujata? Yes, ma'am, please. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Madam, uh, Vatkar Madam, yeah. when there is a failed intubation with muscle relaxant and you have awakened the patient, it is always better to go for other options rather than trying other muscle relaxant like uh, fiber optic intubation or whatever uh, uh, the uh, whatever you have the other gadgets or options available with you rather if it is an emergency surgery rather than waiting for uh, uh, <coughs> the time that the sugamatex disappears from the body no no i think her point was that even if you do an awake yeah. intubation you'll yeah. need a relaxant for the surgery right yeah. so relaxant i'm talking about relaxant so yeah. as sir said correctly you can give other um, like cisatracurium, atracurium drugs, which doesn't really need Sugamadex reversal. Second thing, I just wanted to mention that the dose of Sugamadex that reverses the rocuronium is 16 mg per kg. So you need some 8 to 9 ampules depending upon the weight of the patient. That takes some time in filling up uh, those ampules. So that has also been to be taken care of. You need some time. So when it is a difficult uh, intubation, uh, CICO situation, 
so that time cannot intubate cannot ventilate situation that time the time has to be considered in filling up 8 to 9 amples of or 8 to 10 amples of supramedic and if especially when you are practicing alone in a private setup single handedly that time is needed to fill the drugs in your syringes in such scenario can we uh, go with tiva as uh, uh, without muscle relaxation we can uh, proceed with the surgery if we are sure. in such a dilemma Sure, if your surgery is such that you can do it without relaxation, even better. I guess, yeah. That yeah. also depends upon how, how can you handle the surgeon. That is also your skills will be tested there. You want to use Tiva without muscle relaxants. Right. In case of renal function, if it is compromised, uh, is there any delay in the Sugamanex clearance? So just... Uh, for unknown reason, it has been uh, given that uh, Sugamade should not be used in end-stage renal diseases. But uh, there are some uh, papers from the South Korea where they have used rocuranium uh, and uh, Sugamade for reversal in end-stage renal disease. What they found is that uh, Sugamade can very well reverse uh, rocuranium in patients with end-stage renal disease, but it takes little longer time as compared to the normal patients. So definitely for uh, patients of CKD, uh, it will not act as fast as in normal patients, but uh, you have to be, uh, you should use it uh, carefully in those patients. Thank you, sir. I guess we have taken all the questions from the chat box. Um, Before we finish, uh, we will have a quick comment from our National Secretary, Dr. Bajwa, sir. Yes, and sir. And then I think we will finish this yes. activity. Thank you, Dr. Balaji. Rather, I was just going to uh, comment further. Now we are using the drug. Sugamadex is in the market. We are using it. What The important thing we have to uh, remember is that the drug metabolites, when you are reversing the drug, when you are reversing the drug coronary, there can be so many metabolites. Even with the advanced research going over the globe, you may not be able to get which are the active metabolites still present in the plasma, which may be having effect on the respiratory center. So, these research will keep on going. The drug evolution will keep on happening. The more progress we make in the drug pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, we will be able to get convinced that these drugs are safe for the patient. As Dr. Divate also said in the beginning, that uh, patient safety is the most important. We should not be having adventurous instinct on the table. Try to stick to the basics which we know best rather than just seeing the journals or some articles that these artic uh, these drugs are good. So better, better to go for these drugs in a difficult cases. I think these are always to be taken <clears throat> under the very, very controlled condition, a supervisory condition, especially when the team is there to help you out. When you are alone, never be, never be bravado, as sir said just previously. Uh, regarding this entire program, uh, I'm really apologies from my side. Uh, I think... First is I skated my mind that today it was 6.30 and secondly I was not feeling a little well so I was not prepared to come at that time. So now joined, uh, missed, uh, I, I attended uh, Dr. Khadeh's lecture, it was good, the presentation was good and Dr. Devate's lecture will always be good because I have been listening to him for so many years now. So there is no problem in uh, because I can listen to him any time. So he will be telling me those things later and again and again and it's always nice to have him on the board every time. But uh, the starting of this series is very important, uh, especially under the able leadership of Dr. Balaji and Dr. Rajesh and all the your executive members. You have taken a very good, a giant leap for the future. These are the academic things. And my message is that always keep the academics and the practitioners balanced in all these academics. Try to involve the practitioners in these type of academy because I think 60 to 65 percent of our nations are practicing as the freelancer or in the multiple centers. So we have to pull them into the academics mainstream. That's the biggest challenge for our society, how to bring them into the academic mainstream. Because uh, whatever we do, we may be working for them in a different practitioner forum, the remuneration and other things. But when you have the practitioner full with knowledge yeah, and the expertise and the skills, I think that's the best way to go forward. The society cannot move because those will be the rate limiting step to go further. Unless and developed practitioners are involved into the academics, we will not be going forward. Now, this these type of series, they are especially very, very important and uh, attendance is good. And I think uh, 
it will be available on YouTube also. Yes, sir. Balaji. Yes, sir. Ah. It will be uploaded on. That's very important because these are lectures which should be because many times people may not be able to attend. They may be busy in the OTs or some family functions or somewhere else, so they can always watch it later. So these are very very essential programs for the building of our NSCI importance in the life and how to go about it in the future also with advancements and updates. <laughs> updates are the the things to go forward. And I think you have chosen a very apt topic, apt platform, and all the senior people are there. I can see their faces and all the executive members are also there. So it's a very, very good beginning from uh, your side. And my best wishes for you. And wherever you require my help, I will always be available. You, wherever you require the help of ISA National, we are always available. My Thank best you. Wish. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, the audience, sir. I ask, uh, request Dr. Rajesh to say a few words. Hmm? And Dr. Rajesh. Hmm? Yes. Uh, very good lectures from Dr. Devati sir and Dr. Sujit Khadai on our recent advances of airway management and a reversal agent. There was very active participation for, from all members of SANS and I'm very uh, happy to see that all the members are taking part in the webinars and asking the questions. I'm very thankful to Dr. Uh, Bajwa sir he, uh, though he was suffering from high grade fever, uh, viral fever, he has joined and he has encouraged with his uh, few words. Which is, I would like to hear from Dr. Manisha Katikar, madam, if there is any advice or uh, expert comment. Manisha Katikar, madam. Yes, it, uh, it, it is indeed an excellent activity, an excellent academic webinar. And as usual, Maharashtra State Chapter, uh, the members are very enthusiastic in joining, asking and listening to all the faculties all over uh, ISA, all over India. And I must say that this activity will definitely help all the private practitioners and will definitely boost up the moral as well as the, I must say, that confidence of uh, practicing in the private setups or the periphery. So congratulations, Dr. Balaji. Dr. Rajesh, for this excellent ac academic activity. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. With this, uh, I would like to conclude this webinar uh, with, uh, with the thanks to all the uh, ISA members taking uh, part in the we uh, webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Always end by saying, long live ISA. Long live Long live I say. Going down. हेलो सर मीटिंग एंड करते हैं